the story of the journey and, and, and that enriching the actual experience and, and giving away some of the treasures that I found on my adventure. Um, so I'll start, I'll start the story back in my office, um, which is in the East End, was in the East End when I was working for the Wilderness Society. And uh, if you can picture me just, oh, no, going back. That might be on auto, oh dear, didn't think of that. Um, picture me lying on the floor of that office, uh, staring up at photos of a screensaver that are flashing up on my computer. And they're photos of the forest that I'm campaigning to protect, but I've actually never stepped foot in. Um, and I'd been a campaigner for the better part of a decade with grassroots groups and then I got this job with the Wilderness Society and it had been a passion of mine ever since I left home and discovered what was happening to the planet and threw myself into the work of, of saving the world, saving forests. Um, but the consuming passion had begun to consume me and I was feeling um, ever more kind of burnt out, exhausted and, and kind of disillusioned because what I was seeing was that for all the passion I put in, if people didn't have a connection to the natural world, if there wasn't that uh, relationship with nature, with the life support systems upon which we relied, then there was nothing, nothing I could say that would actually get people to act or change. And I realised that there was this deeper reason for the ecological crisis, which is our, um, our society's separation from the natural world and I started to feel that in myself and I started to feel like I didn't care so much anymore because I wasn't actually connected with the places I was trying to save uh, but it wasn't just the job it was just this sense of this busyness of life that I would tick one thing off the list and another thing would take its place and I felt like a bit of an iceberg like all I ever saw and all anyone else saw was the tip of the iceberg above the surface and underneath lay this bulk of myself, this bulk of potential that I didn't have time to explore, it didn't have time to show itself because I was just too damn busy. And it just started to feel like I had to do something about that. There was a deep calling to discover what lay beneath the surface. And I didn't know how or what to do about that. I just kept going about my life and feeling more and more like I was living a half-life. Um, about that time, I think you can slide, slide thanks. Um, actually, I just want to read you one excerpt from my book, um, which explains this, oh, I'll say it actually. Um, about that time, I got an email in my inbox that said, a nature philosophy course, four days of wilderness survival skills and um, nature awareness, and something in me just went, go. And I went along and those, um, those few days when I built my first survival shelter and had my first go at lighting fires with sticks and cooked bush food on the fire and walked blindfolded through the forest in the freezing cold, something in me just absolutely woke up in a way that hadn't in a long time. And it, it really, I felt more alive than, than I could remember. And I just followed that thread and it took me it took me to the United States to study wilderness survival skills and tracking and awareness and shamanic practices. And during this time, the idea of this year-long program came up and that's when I knew um, that I was going to do it. Walk. And if you ever go to Arnhem Land or anywhere where they still walk around barefoot, you'll see this fox walk. It's not like our heel stomp, heel stomp, heel stomp where the vibrations just go right through the earth and you... Um, and, um, you know, jolting your body. It's this sense of just walking like a fox seamlessly without any straddle, without any pitch, just this very smooth sense of walking where you're feeling the earth underneath your feet and you're seeing the landscape through your feet. And then the, the looking is not this tunnel vision that we're so used to, but this wide-angle vision where we take in everything to do with our surroundings. We take in as much as we can possibly see. And of course, this was vital for survival. You know, it's not very efficient to just see what's right in front of you, but you need to see everything that's around you. And what I found was the more and more I practiced these skills, they were core routines, the more my awareness of everything, including what was happening inside me, opened up to deeper and deeper levels. They were very powerful skills. Of course, not all creatures were that friendly. I did wake up one night to find a snake trying to get into my mosquito net. And there were dog prints as large as my hand, sometimes near my shelter. 
and I heard them howling and I, I wasn't scared. I was scared of the dark when I arrived, but I really worked on that. But dogs continued to scare me. Um, but, you know, there weren't really many run-ins <laughs> with snakes. And I had a huge spider in my hair. That was probably my scariest oh. moment. That was not much fun. So, um, the next kind of step was just launching myself into the wonderful world of earth skills. And there were both um, the kind of hard, hard skills of, of survival in terms of, you know, lighting fire and... Um, my shelter, the, the, you know, the, the sacred order of survival, just what you needed day to day. And I might point out, of course, that it wasn't just eating what's on the land. I would have faded away within the first week and the land would not have supported any of us. We had a hundred acre property to do this program, plus um, a huge national park on the, on the back of it. But um, we had bulk dry foods. You know, I was existing a lot on rice and lentils and um, oats and I'd eat bush food every day, but there was, yeah, it wasn't survivor, it wasn't bare grills by any stretch of the imagination. But certainly um, there was there was a range of skills that we were introduced into, everything from hide tanning, flint napping, um, ta uh, did I say, I oh, did say hide tanning, um, bird language, tracking, um, primitive pottery, primitive basketry, rope and string making, landscape ecology, bush tucker, bush gathering, hunting. Uh, the list was kind of endless and every skill was a doorway to oh, like a, a lifetime of study and I just felt like I'd get these tasters of these incredible skills and then felt like I needed a whole year on that one skill. But I really just dived into them because I just found them so well, partly so enjoyable, but what these skills seemed to me to be doing was filling in this missing piece of the puzzle. Where when I was a campaigner, I was disconnected from the actual elements. And when I started researching, you know, eco-psychology and looking at deep ecology and different ways to connect to Earth, I followed those threads and they were fantastic, but it was something to do with the physicality of this the actual taking of materials from the land. You know, the harvesting of all my basket weaving materials and then the drying of them and then the re-soaking or the, the harvesting. You know, I made all my own string to um, lash my shelter together. So that meant taking off, you know, loads of, of bark from wattle. And through that process, I got to know when the sap ran and when it dried out. So I got to know the tree in such an intimate way because I was taking from it. So it was this sense of these skills. In one way, there was a violence to it. I was taking and using them. But that was the doorway into the relationship, the, the, the kind of relationship that I was craving. So I could walk around in the landscape and instead of just seeing this wall of green, I started to see plants that were edible and medicinal, plants that I could weave with, plants that I could make string with. Um, it was just, it, the land just became friendly and my walk, my walks and wanders were different, you know, once I did primitive pottery then I'd be looking for the clay cuttings and feeling with my feet in the creek for where the clay is and um, it just became this rich adventure land. <clears throat> so if you flick through, so I'll just go through some of those photos, that was me collecting a water lily that you can eat all the, the roots and stems. Um, back one day, that was my uh, my holiday home. I built a little holiday home down the creek because I started to feel like my shelter was getting a bit suburban. So uh, that was my my little hobbit home down down by the creek. Um, we, you know, we did coal burning of spoons and bowls and um, pottery to to boil water with. Um, keep going, Dave. That's just <laughs> yep. That was uh, the Hyde the Hyde uh, fashion parade, and actually I'm wearing my my deer hide top that I tanned from. We did a brain tanning process, which brains of the animal is actually this is an amazing fact. Every animal has enough brains to tan its own hide. I find that absolutely incredible. I don't know who discovered that, but it works. 
And I've never worn my high top in any other talk, but I felt like Newcastle could, you know, yeah. could handle my high top, so it's out and about tonight. Um, Primary pottery, we did a firing outside, which was had limited success, I must say. Um, yeah, there's just, you know, even little things like making, whittling the hook that hang my billy on and the string to hang my billy on, everything like that just gave me such joy to do and to create. It was like creating from my own hands and from the earth the tools I needed for life, for my survival. And there was just something about, I think, the promise of these skills, like pairing back life to the barest of essentials that seemed to promise to me that I would also pair all the gunk and the bulk of myself back to find the essence that I was searching for. Do you, do you need to take a... Is there like a break? It's, I think I've talked for half an hour. Yeah, I have talked for half an hour. Okay. I can keep going. Yes, I'll, I'll do another... Yes, fire. I'll talk about fire. Um, yeah, hang there, Dave. So, in terms of earth skills, fire... <clears throat> fire. Hmm. Fire was the thing, the skill that taught me the most about everything, and it continues to do so. Uh, when I first saw a woman grab a stick and spin it onto another stick and create a fire, create a, a coal and create a fire, it was the most amazing, profound, intimate thing I'd ever seen, and I wanted it so badly. It just, there was something so alchemical, so incredibly simple about that process, um, it just symbolised, I guess it symbolised maybe what I was craving, everything that I was craving, the spark, the, it, the power. It symbolised pure, raw power and connectedness. So, of course, something I wanted so badly wasn't going to come easily. And I practised a little bit over the two years before I actually went bush. And I decided to make a really clear decision to only light fires by primitive means the entire year. Every time I wanted a cup of tea or wanted to warm myself, it had to be by primitive means. And there wasn't a rule about that. It was strongly encouraged, but there was very little structure. But I was going on the assumption of the greater the need, the greater the result. So uh, three months in, and I had blood blisters the size of 20 cent coins on both my palms that were incredibly painful to touch and I created a lot of smoke and no fire. That's with hand drill. Hand drill is this method and I brought my precious kit tonight. Um, just, I might just hold it, it's just nice to hold. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Don't mind me. Um, so hand drill is the indigenous method to this land. It's usually a grass tree flower stalk and you can use a grass tree flower stalk board or um, this is wild tobacco. So this is, a, this is what I wanted more than anything, just the simplicity of this technique that was used on the, this land. But I couldn't bloody get it. <laughs> and the harder I tried, the more it seemed to elude me. I had another method called the bow drill, which uses a bow and a string and a spindle. It was used around the world. Native Americans used it, Egyptians. And I could get fire on that method, so most of the time which meant I could have a cup of tea, although my tea addiction really went way down. Because you just don't want to light a fire every time, you know, rub sticks together every time you want a cup of tea. Um, but, and also it felt like it was cheating a bit. I was using, you know, I was using a method that wasn't indigenous to this land. So, three months in, and one night I'm like spitting madly, spitting madly, and hurled my kick in anger. Why won't you give this to me? I'm trying so, so, so hard. And the words of my instructor came back to me. She said, trying against the effort. And I thought, what does she mean by this, trying against the effort? How can you want something so badly and yet not try for it? And I put a blindfold on. And instead of focusing on how close I was, how much smoke there was, how much dust there was in the notch, I just focused instead on the smell of the wood dust and the feel of the stalk between my palms 
and when I took off my blindfold, there was a coal, and I knew that there was going to be a coal halfway through it when I heard that sweet spot. It just hits the sweet spot, and you just know it's coming. Um, so this is what fire taught me, to want something and give something your everything, but without the striving, without the focus on the outcome. It's that whole thing of enjoying the journey and not getting focused on the destination. And it continued to teach me that all through the year. It wasn't smooth sailing after that, but I had cracked it. And from then on, it was, um, it was, a, it was a slow burn of a relationship. <laughs> Um, and it continues to be so, and I've lost a lot of my form, but it's still, on my birthday this year, I, I, I got my first solo call in a while. I just had proof that I could have lived here and done my wilderness experience, because um, a, quite a large spider just climbed right up my skirt. What? <laughs> Very nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> Laura saw it. So we left off with fire. And uh, fire was most important, of course, in winter. And my book is um, structured both around the sacred order of survival and the season starting in summer. And I'd like to read you the first page of winter. <clears throat> I waked the cry of a solitary karawong muffled through the grass walls. It sounds marbled, a lament tinged with yearning. I close my eyes to the tendril of light reaching in for me and instead let the dream images hovering on the edge of my awareness pull me back. A kitten, playful and curious, lost inside a noisy nightclub. I'm looking for it. Where has it gone? My grandmother smiling at me encouragingly. The vine of light is wrapped around my ankle, tugging gently. Groaning, I obey, pulling on thermals, parka, boots, beanie, scarf and gloves. Strands of blady grass brush my hair as I stoop under the archway door and step out into an ethereal white mist. Steam rises from the snaking stream my pee makes in the sand. A piece of scribbly bark makes good enough toilet paper. Shrouded in white, my shelter looks like a giant forest snail. Winter becomes this forest, the mist softening the sharp edges, airbrushing the scars. Everything is slowing, contracting, having been pruned back to its pure form. The thump of a swamp wallaby moving north along its breakfast route, the drop of nectar hanging from the single remaining blood red mountain devil flower, my exposed brown wrist collecting a bracelet of damp. Sporadic bird calls punctuate the quiet like bells in a monastery. I focus on the spaces in between. There is no absence of sound in these gaps though. A hum grows loud in my chest and legs. My shoulders drop, as does my centre of gravity. I thrum in synchronicity with the forest. So each season certainly had its flavour, starting with uh, the activity of summer. And coming into a true hibernation in winter. And it was a solitude that I had really long yearned for. And even out there in the bush, I really had to fight for it. Um, I, the others went away to learn um, bushcraft in Arnhem Land and I decided not to go and to spend the time alone. And I spent pretty much three months not really seeing many people. I'd cross the others occasionally when they got back, but I, kind of rolled down my fat shutters and, and went into a very conscious and deliberate hibernation. And it was something I'd been wanting to do for a long time. And of course, I was looking for change, you know, real significant fundamental change in myself and an exploration of my inner world. And we always have these ideas of what transformation looks like, you know, coming into oneness with everything and peace and, and it never really quite works out that way and I it was a it was both an exquisitely beautiful time of the year and also a very very challenging period of time um, basically what came up in the shadowy rooms of solitude was a whole host of parts of myself that I 
didn't really know that well, that, um, was, that, that were hidden under the city's busyness and distractions and entertainment. And where there's really nowhere else to go, um, then you're just looking in a mirror all day. And the forest mirrors back that identity. You know, there's, that's the thing. There was absolutely no social identity on which to rest. Um, my mentor at the time told me that the forest is in constant flow and when you steep yourself in that environment, then the places in you that are, that are stuck and the rigid will seek to move as well. I thought it sounded like a nice kind of analogy, but that's actually what happened, is these hard, rigid judgments and beliefs and ways that I had done things just didn't work there anymore. Um, I saw how judgmental I was of myself and how critical I was, how driven, and you can split the slide, Dave, um, how driven and how much I needed my sense of identity and my sense of self to be um, centred around what I did with my day, how productive I was. It, you know, even I'd taken myself out of the city and, and still I was writing lists, lists in my journal and how many baskets had I made, how much tracking had I done. I mean, it was just crazy, really. And so I entered into this period that became like a kind of an underworld descent where my the night world and the day world merged. My dreams were incredibly vivid. I was deliberately not sticking to any routine, so I was sometimes up walking around the forest at night, sometimes sleeping during the day, and everything became more vivid. My emotional world, my energetic body just really woke up. And my homework or my guideline for that period was asking myself, what do I feel like doing? Really, in any one moment, what do I feel like doing? It sounds really simple. But learning to follow my heart was actually quite challenging. And um, it, was, it was really a period of waking up that feeling sense and learning to trust my heart, whether I wanted to sit in the hammock or, um, or go for a walk without any sense of time or destination. And that's really in terms of what I did during the day in winter. I mean, fire you know, took up a lot of time to keep myself warm. Um, but I would just, all I wanted to do was wander. And this sense of wandering was so different to the walking that I'd done in previous times, you know, with a heavy pack on and, and going from A to B and knowing where I was going to get to. I'd set off in the morning, often just check in with my sit spot like, like it was my anchor and then, and then, you know, go out from there, scatter out from there and just explore in broader and broader concentric rings this forest I lived in. And I, I learnt, I learnt pretty soon to take a water bottle around my shoulder and pack a, you know, some nuts in my pocket because I'd end up going for hours and I would have no agenda but just let curiosity be my guide and let my feet just take me where I wanted to go. And it was this sense of I was exploring the external world, um, wandering the external world, the physical world, at the same time as I was wandering my internal. And it became very much a process of uh, the walking was integral to this this um, learning to trust my intuition and trust my next step. Um, and so winter was quite quite a kind of navel gazing time where I, I went deeply inside and and what I eventually realised I was doing doing was actually learning how to not do and how to be. And it was embracing what I called the wild woman, or this wild feminine, which wasn't interested in goals and outcomes, but which is interested in the process and in feeling and in intuition. And it was really bringing alive this part of myself that, um, that I hadn't before, that I'd been so you know, high achieving and driven that it just didn't have an opportunity. And that really is um, kind of what I feel like uh, was the core learning of my year. <clears throat> so moving on from winter, um, that's just another photo of me <coughs> sitting in my shelter. Spring. Spring comes around and I emerge from my hibernation somewhat, somewhat a little, <coughs> a little weary, um, but focus a lot on food in, in spring and it's when I really put a lot of energy into learning a lot about plants. So we're climbing a bangalow palm. Well, Nikki is climbing a bangalow palm. I'm watching. Um, 
And it's the time where I felt finally like it was, I had permission to hunt. I had taken a couple of lives, small animals, but this was a time where I felt I really had permission and it was time that I wanted to take from the land in the way that meant that I could survive on land. Because up until then, I thought I wouldn't be able to survive. So uh, that meant taking the life of a wallaby, actually. Um, and it's quite a long story. You might read about it in my book. But in the end, it was a, a few weeks of really... Um, trial and error, both on the physical snare traps and also quite a process of intention setting and finally deciding that, yes, I'm really ready to do this. And when I had made that intention clear, the next day I came across the wallaby that was in my trap. And that process for me of confronting death so um, intimately uh, was such an incredible um, experience of the, the visceral you know, the skinning, and I, we, you know, tried to use every part of the animal possible. So I tanned the hide, which is now this uh, bag for my fire sticks, and used the, uh, the meat, obviously, to eat and to dry for food in the, in the next month, and the sinew for thread and so on. But it was in that process I really saw the gift of life, you know, that this wallaby had given its life, and now it was in me. And then it was my kind of duty to honour life because I'm honouring the wallaby if I honour life and I hadn't really ever seen it in that way. So I want to leave some room for questions. So I'm going to move on from wallaby stories and food good at gathering and that was that was just a morning of gathering. We've got bulrush and lamandra, lily pilly, dianella, um, pandanus, coastal bearded heath. Gosh, I just absolutely loved just setting out with a basket that I'd made and collecting these berries. In spring, of course, that's when most of them are fruiting. Um, yeah, fantastic. And actually, when I walked to Meriwether Beach just this week, I saw four plants and I feasted on pig face fruit this week on Burwood Beach. Absolutely feasted. I think I'm the only one eating them and they are literally as good as strawberries. So hot tip, Burwood Beach, pig face at the moment are fantastic. <laughs> so uh, the question of how has, how has it changed me? How has this experience changed me? Well, friends are the best mirror of that <coughs> and they tell me I'm more flexible <laughs> and I'm more present and I have more time with, for them. And that's really the best feedback that I've been given. Um, in many ways, I feel less certain about things. I've lost that youthful certainty of this is how things are and this is the way life will unfold. I feel groundless in lots of ways. And funny, just last night, I said to someone, you know, there's been this kind of almost this heartache or this emptiness on one level ever since I left that year. And I think partly that is because I stepped so far outside of this... Western lifestyle for a year and developed a relationship with the elements, with the earth, that, you know, for me was far beyond anything I experienced and to come back from that has been really difficult and there's, it's almost like I've seen the potential in what life could be like if we're really deeply connected to the seasons and to um, the animals and to our food sources and our water and it's just so deeply nourishing. And to not have that intimacy anymore, I find it really difficult. And part of tonight's, the title of tonight was Rewilding the Urban Soul. Like, how can we bring these things into our life? And I, I will talk a little bit about that. Um, but I think that deep resonance with the earth, it, it's still a foundation, even though there's this kind of groundlessness, there's this foundation of um, much more of a settled knowledge of, you know, this essence this essence that I am and this essence that I'm a part of, the spirit that moves through all things. Um, and in, in some ways, I've, I've just feel everything more deeply. And the, the, the Buddhist um, activist Thich Nhat Hanh was once asked, if we could do one thing to save the world, what's the most important thing we could do? And he said, to listen to the sounds of the earth crying. And for me, that's about awakening that feeling self, to actually have sensitivity and the awareness to hear the sounds of the earth crying or to hear the beauty of the earth, to just feel it, to just 
listen. So that, I think, is one of the gifts that I've taken away from that year. Um, and in terms of... I think there's another slide in there. <clears throat> oh, this is the last slide, and I absolutely love this quote. Um, Harold Furman, it's in my book. Don't ask what the world needs, but ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs most are people who have come alive. Mm. And I think that, for me, really sums up where I feel um, my message is. It's, it's, it's not necessarily in going bush for a year. It's finding something that really makes you come alive. <coughs> finding the things that really wake you up, that make you come alive and, going, and doing that. Because that is responding to what, um, what, is, what the world needs. Um, and what, since I've launched my book, I've heard from so many people this call to the wild. They come up and say, oh, I, just, I just really want to go to nature. I've really, I, you know, I've always had this desire. Or um, this, I had this experience this week. I was in Westfield, my one and only trip to Westfield each year. It's in Qatar in the, in the car park. Um, walking out and this woman wound down her window and she said I'm reading your book <laughs> and she just looked like you know kind of middle class mum suburban mum and she said oh, I, my, I'm only a third of the way through oh you're struggling but you, you're really struggling but I totally resonate with you I said oh really in what way do you resonate and she said Oh, you're just talking about, you know, being on the land and just having time to just breathe and, and you want to be alone and, and I just know how you feel. <laughs> but, oh, that's it, you know. It's, there, there is this archetypal kind of call to just experience ourselves as just one more creature in the forest, to just breathe, to just be on the earth, to just sit doesn't need to be for a year and I came away from that just oh you know I've been hating Westfield and I came away just thinking it's in all of us you know it's 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 in all of us and it's this movement that I'm calling a rewilding rewilding of the soul which is the title I wanted to call my book um, and for me this represents this um, this discovering the, the undomesticated parts of ourselves and uh, to reawaken this kind of instinctive self. And the word rewilding, I don't know if anyone has watched that YouTube clip of Yellowstone National Park in the United States. So this is, the rewilding is a word that's describing this process it's that, that's happening, it's a campaign that's happening in Europe and America to bring back the top order predators onto the landscape. So in Yellowstone National Park, they brought back wolves. And that one, that one thing, bringing back wolves, created a um, cascade of effects yeah. that changed the actual invertebrates of the river and the river's flow. I mean, everything from the wolves changed where the deer fed, which changed the tree line, mm. changed the birds, the carrion, the fish, the, oh, it was absolutely incredible. Just YouTube, Yellowstone rewilding. So there's another movement that's saying, well, we need to rewild ourselves as well. A, re a wild earth needs wild people to caretake. Um, and so I'm saying well, bring back the top order predators in, in our lives, which is our, in our instinctive awareness, our capacity to, to feel, um, our capacity to know what brings us alive and to follow that. Um, the Huffington Post recently published an article which said uh, that nature reconnection is the next big human movement. And I like, I'd like to think that's true, and I feel like it's... I feel from what I've heard in the last six months since releasing this book and talking about this journey is that is something that's that's moving, this desire to reconnect. And it's in so many different ways, in, in places like this, in living living like this, in community gardens, in, in tending our own gardens, in, you know, the desire to go camping, go bush, and just reconnect in lots of different ways to the natural world and to our wilder selves and to the, the wild creatures that we, that we are, that is our ancestry, that's in our genes. So I might leave it there for my rave and see if anyone has any questions.